Thanks for reminding me. I totally would have forgotten that. So let's get started. I got a big fancy complicated data set. I'm gonna shrink it down dimension wise. I got a big fancy complicated data set. I'm gonna shrink it down from a lot of dimensions down to just a few dimensions. It's gonna be totally awesome. StatQuest. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for coming to class. <laughs> uh, let me get this. Uh, I'm all, I'm all tangled up on my ukulele. Let me get this thing off me. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Bam. All right. So is everyone, can everyone see that? Yes. Hooray. Okay, so today we're going to cover three ways to make a big, funky, complicated data set easier to make sense of. Oops. Uh, one way is called PCA, which is short for Principal Component Analysis. Another way is called MDS, which is short for Multidimensional Scaling, which to be honest is the coolest sounding of these three techniques. And the last one is called Linear Discriminant Analysis. They all sound super fancy and complicated. They're not. So uh, without further ado, Let's start talking about PCA and we're going to go through PCA step by step and we're actually going to go through it step by step multiple times. So by the time we're done with PCA, you guys will have it down cold. Okay, so in this stack quest, uh, we're going to go through principal component analysis one step at a time using something called singular value decomposition. So uh, there are two primary ways to do uh, 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 PCA. One is to use something called singular value decomposition, which sounds super fancy, and we'll go through that. And the other way, the older way, is to use what's called a covariance matrix. And uh, a lot of times when people teach uh, PCA, they teach it from the covariance matrix perspective, but nobody ever does PCA that way. Everybody does PCA with singular value decomposition. Um, and so that's the way we're going to do it. I actually think it's more intuitive to go through the singular value decomposition way. So it not only is it the newer way that everyone actually does in practice, it's actually easier to understand. However, just so we can cover all our bases, we're at, when we get through the end of this, we're actually going to review uh, how to think about PCA in terms of a covariance matrix. And so you'll have both perspectives of the same process. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn what PCA does, how it does it, and how to use it to get deeper insight into your data. So we're gonna start with a simple data set. Uh, we've measured transcription of two genes, gene one and gene two, in six different mice. Uh, note, if you're not into mice and genes, and I know a lot of people are not, I used to work in a mouse genetics lab, and so I used to be way into them. That was my thing. Uh, but some people aren't into mice and genes. Uh, so you can think of the mice as individual samples and the genes as variables that we measure for each sample. For example, the samples uh, could be students in high school and the variables could be test scores in math and reading or the samples could be businesses and the variables could be market capitalization and number of employees or whatever, you know, it's just, it's just data. Okay, so now we're back to mice and genes. If we only measure one gene, we can plot the data on a number line. Mice one, two, and three have relatively high values and mice four, five, and six have relatively low values. In math land, a number line is called a one-dimensional graph because a line spans a single dimension. Even though it's a simple graph and it shows us that mice one, two, and three are most similar to each other uh, than they are to mice four, five, and six, if we measured two genes, uh, then we can plot the data on a two-dimensional XY graph. And in this case, gene one is the X-axis 
spans one of the two dimensions in this graph. And gene two is the y-axis and spans the other dimension. We can see that mice, again, we can see that mice one, two, and three cluster on the right side and mice four, five, and six cluster in the lower left side. If we measured three genes, we would like, uh, uh, we would add another axis uh, to the graph to make it look 3D or three-dimensional. So in this case, we've got uh, smaller dots uh, that have larger values for gene three and they're further away and larger dot, uh, excuse me, the small dots are, are uh, that was a miss, smaller, types, smaller dots have larger values for gene three and are further away. The larger dots have smaller values for gene three and are closer. And this is something, uh, you know, I've got this video online and people watch it all the time. And this is something that people are perpetually confused with um, in that I'm trying to draw something that's three dimensional on a two dimensional surface. Your computer screen is only two dimensions, but there is, you just imagine that there's depth and imagine that gene three goes out the back of your screen and into the wall behind you or out the window or wherever you're sitting, it just keeps going. And so it represents some sort of depth and that we're just sort of trying to fake it on this two dimensional screen of your. Okay, if we measured four, four genes, however, we can no longer plot the data. Four genes require four dimensions. And yes, a, a lot of people say, hey, what if we change the shapes of things? Couldn't that be represent a dimension or something? And that's true, or we can change colors. And there's lots of little things you can do to kind of fake extra dimensions. But the reality is, um, if we have lots of dimensions, and oftentimes with genomics data sets, we've got uh, 20,000 dimensions. We might have measured every single gene in the mouse. Um, and that would give us a 20,000 dimensional plot. So, um, so, you know, at some point we're gonna reach a threshold where we can no longer draw it. Um, and so what we're gonna talk about now is how PCA can take four or, mean four or more gene measurements and thus four or more dimensions of data and make it a two dimensional PCA plot. Uh, this plot will show us that similar mice cluster together. And we'll also talk about how PCA can tell us which gene or variable is the most valuable for clustering the data. For example, PCA might tell us that gene three is responsible for separating samples along the x-axis. Lastly, we'll talk about how PCA can tell us how accurate the 2D graph is. To understand what PCA does and how it works, let's go back to the data set that only had two genes. We'll start by plotting the data. Then we calculate the average measurement for gene one. So, uh, so the data is on this two-dimensional graph. Um, and what we do is we're just going to look at all the x-axis coordinates for the data, and we're going to calculate the average value. And that's that red x. And the average measurement for gene two. So gene two is on the y-axis. And so we're just taking the y-axis coordinates and we're averaging those. With the average values, we can calculate the center of the data. And it's basically, we just draw a line from each average value and where they intersect is the center of the data. So from this point on, we're gonna focus on what happens in the graph and we will no longer need the original data. So there's our data. Now we'll shift the data so that the center is on top of the origin, so 0.0. .0. So we're gonna shift the data, boop, 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 bam. So now that X, which represents the center of the data, uh, is, is sitting smack dab on zero, zero, the origin of the graph. Note, shifting the data did not change how the data points are positioned relative to each other. This point is still the highest one, and this point is still the rightmost point. So the relationship between the data has been preserved. All we've done is just move it. Okay, now that the data are centered on the origin, we can try to fit a line to it. To do this, we start by drawing a random line that goes through the origin. 
Then we rotate the line until it fits the data as well as it can, given that it has to go through the origin. Ultimately, this line fits best. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, we need to talk about how PCA decides if a fit is good or not. So how do we even define what best is? So let's go back to the original random line that goes through the origin. And now we're going to talk about how to quantify how good this line fits the, the data. So what, what PCA does is it projects the data onto it. So we project it onto, and you'll notice that these projections are perpendicular to the line. Um, so if you're familiar with regression uh, analysis, you may or may not be, but if you are, regression uses a vertical uh, projection where we go vertically up. Uh, but with linear regression, we go perpendicular to that line that we're trying to project onto. And then it can either measure the distances from the data to the line and try to find the line that minimizes these distances, or it can try to find the line that maximizes the distances from the projected points to the origin. If these two options don't seem equivalent to you, you're not alone. <laughs> So what we can do is we can build intuition by looking at how these distances shrink when the line fits better. So we can see as the line fits better, those distances get smaller. And as, it, as, that, those, as, the line, as the line fits worse, they get bigger. So we, so we can see this, you know, like, yeah, sure, those distances get small when the line fits better. While these distances, the distances from the projected data to the origin, those distances these distances will get larger when the line fits better. So watch, you see the projected points start moving further and further out on the line. And as, as the line fits the data better, and as, as the line fits it worse, those distances get a little shorter. Now, I'm gonna show you how that works mathematically. So to understand what's going on in a mathematical way, let's consider one data point. This point is fixed. So it's distance from the origin. Oh, excuse me, this, this point is fixed. And so is its distance from the origin. In other words, the distance from the point to the origin doesn't change when the red line or the red dotted line rotates. So we got this red dotted line and it's rotating, but that the distance from the point, the data point to the origin is fixed. When we project the point onto the line, and remember we're doing a perpendicular projection, we get a right angle between the black dotted line and the red dotted line. And that means that if we label the sides like this, A, B, and C, then we can use the Pythagorean theorem to show how B and C are inversely related. Since a, and thus a squared, does not change, if b gets bigger, that's the distance from the point to the line, then c, the distance on the line, must get smaller because we got this equality and we have to balance that equality. So if b gets bigger, c has to get smaller because a is not changing. Likewise, if c gets bigger, then B must get smaller, again, because A is not changing. And we have to balance the change in C with a, or the increase in C with a decrease in B. Thus, PCA can either minimize the distance to the line or it can maximize the distance from the projected point to the origin. The reason I'm making such a fuss about this is that intuitively, it makes sense to minimize B the distance from the point to the line. But it's actually easier to calculate C, the distance from the projected point to the origin. So PCA finds the best fitting line by maximizing the sum 
of the square distances from the projected points to the origin. And that's a mouthful. And we're gonna, we're gonna step through that one, one piece at a time. So, uh, so you'll get to see how we maximize the sum of the square distances from the projected points to the origin. You'll get to see that in action. So here we go. So for this line, so this is, the, this is that original randomly selected line. PCA projects the data onto it. Then measures the distance from this point, we're gonna call that D1 to the origin, or the, that distance is gonna be called D1. And I'm gonna keep track of the distances we measure up here. So in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, we've got D1. And then we measure the distance from the next point. So this point to the origin, so that's D2. And then we measure D3, D4, D5, and D6. So we've measured all six distances from the projected point to the origin. So here they are. Next thing we do is we square them. And the distances are squared one reason we're doing that is that so that the negative values underneath the x-axis do not cancel out the positive values. It also helps with the math uh, to square things um, because we've got to, con uh, this is a side note, um, not a main idea related to PCA, but oftentimes in data science, you'll see that we're squaring things all the time when we could, in theory, use the absolute value. Now, one of the reasons why we don't use the absolute value is uh, it has a messy derivative at, at, at zero. It in fact has no derivative at zero. Uh, whereas when we square things, we have a nice continuous thing uh, and we have derivatives all over the place. So this is a, an aside that is kind of not to the point, but it's just out of curiosity, you may be wondering why we're always squaring things in data science. And it's just because it makes the math easier because there's derivatives all over the place. Okay, then we sum up these squared distances. And that gives us the sum of squared distances. And we're just gonna call that the sum of squared distances. We're gonna little, use a little shorthand uh, for, for from here on out. Now we rotate the line, project the data onto the line and then sum up the square distances from the projected points to the origin. Boop, boop, boop. And we repeat until we end up with the line with the largest sum of square distances between the projected points and the origin. Boop, boop, boop. Ultimately, we end up with this line. It has the largest sum of the square distances. This line the one with the largest sum of the squared distances is called principal component one or PC1 for short. PC1 has a slope of 0 0.25. And by the way, a lot of people ask, where does that slope come from? Well, you remember we, we started with a random line and in order to start with that random line, we had to pick a random slope. We already knew it goes to the origin, so the intercept is zero, but the slope is just some random value. And then we started rotating it. And as we rotate that line, we, in order to rotate it, we have to know what that slope is. So we're, we're not just guessing at what this slope is. We, we define it. We say, we're going to see what the sum of the squared distances are for a line with slope 0 0.25. And we go, hey, wow, well, these are the best. Bam, that's awesome. OK, in other words, for every four units, we go out along the gene 1 axis we go up one unit along the gene two axis. So the slope of 0 0.25 is over four, up one. Um, and that means that the data are mostly spread out along the gene one axis. And only spread out a little bit along the gene two axis. So relatively little spread on the gene two axis. One way to think about PC1 is in the terms of a cocktail recipe or a mocktail recipe. It's really up to you. It's personal preference. Anyways, to make PC1, we mix four parts of gene one with one part gene two, and then we pour over ice and serve. And it's a refreshing beverage. Trust me. <laughs> 
Anyways, the ratio of gene one to gene two tells you that gene one is more important when it comes to describing how the data are spread out along PC1. Oh no, it's the terminology alert. Mathematicians call this cocktail recipe a linear combination of genes one and two. I mentioned this because when someone says PC1 is a linear combination of variables, which sounds very sophisticated, this is what they're talking about. They're just saying PC1 consists of so many parts gene one and so many parts gene two. And this is, this is the recipe for the principal component. It's no big deal. The recipe for PC1 going over four and up one gets us to this point. We can solve for the length of the red line using the Pythagorean theorem. The old a squared plus equals b squared plus c squared. And we just plug in the numbers, bam, and we do the math, and we get 4.12. So the length of the red line is 4.12. When you do PCA with singular value decomposition, that's what SVD stands for, singular value decomposition, the recipe for PC1 is scaled so that its length is one. So all we have to do to scale the triangle so that the red line is one unit long is divide each side by the original length, which is 4.12. So, so for those of you keeping score, here's the math worked out that shows that all we need to do is divide all three sides by 4.12. Um, this is just sort of an aside. You can come back and look at the video later uh, if, if you're dying to understand this derivation. Um, I just, I don't want you to think I'm trying to trick you. <laughs> Anyways, um, here are all the scaled values. So we've got, um, so we've got one, you know, that, 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 that line going from the origin to where the, um, the, <clears throat> the X and Y sort of the, over and up part, it's that, that red line is now one unit long. So that's awesome. And that new, and the new values change our recipe. So now to make PC1, we mix 0 0.97 parts of gene one with 0 0.242 parts of gene two. But the ratio is the same. We still use four times as much gene one as gene two. We've just got fancier looking numbers with decimal points. Okay, so now we're back to looking at the data and the best fitting line and the unit vector that we just calculated. Okay, here's another terminology alert. This one unit long vector consisting of 0 0.97 parts gene one and 0 0.242 parts gene two is called the singular vector or the eigenvector for PC1. And I'll be honest with you, um, every now and then, I mean, I've made this video a few years ago and, and uh, but every now and then I have to review this because I'm terrible with terminology and I, can, I can't remember if the singular vector and the eigenvector are the same or not. Um, and, you know, anyways, is it, is it scaled? Is it one unit? Can it be longer? I don't know. So I can never remember these things, but uh, so this is how I remember is I actually go back to this and I look at it from time to time myself. Um, and the, uh, what, what I do remember always is that the proportions of each gene are called loading scores. Also, while I'm at it, PC calls the sum of the squared distances for the best fit line, the eigenvalue for PC1. So we've got the sum of the squared distances for PC1 equals eigenvalue for PC1. And that's just some lingo that you gotta get used to because if you have ever, ever do PC1, EPCA in practice, someone's going to be like, what are the eigenvalues? And you're like, oh, well, they're just the sum of the square distances. No big deal. And if we take the square root of the eigenvalue for PC1, uh, that's called the singular value for PC1. So the, um, so the thing I always get confused is that the eigenvalue and singular value, they're not the same thing. One is the square root or the square of the other. Uh, but the singular vector and the eigenvector 
are the same. Anyways, bam, that's a lot of terminology. You guys just made it through. And I just made it too. So I'm good for like another six months of knowing what those terms refer to. It's like getting a vaccine booster, I guess. Anyways, now that we've got PC1 and all figured out, let's work on PC2. Because this is only a two-dimensional graph, PC2 is simply the line that goes to the origin that is perpendicular to PC1 without any further optimization that has to be done. It's just the line perpendicular to PC1. And that means that the recipe for PC2 is negative one parts gene one uh, to four parts gene two. And if we scale everything so that we get a unit vector, the recipe is now negative 0.242 parts gene one and 0.97 parts gene two. Uh, this is the singular vector for PC2, and that's also the eigenvector. So the singular vector and the eigenvector are the same. And these are loading scores for PC2. They tell us that in terms of how the values are projected onto PC2, gene 2 is four times as important as gene 1. Lastly, the eigenvalue for PC2 is the sum of the squares of the distances between the projected points in the origin. And the singular value is then the square root of that eigenvalue. So, so hooray, we've worked out PC1 and PC2. To draw the final PCA plot, we simply rotate everything so that PC1 is horizontal. And then we use the projected points to find where the samples go in the PCA plot. For example, these two projected points correspond to sample six. So sample six goes here. Sample two goes here. Sample one goes here, etc. Double bam. So that's how PCA is done using singular value decomposition or SVD for short. Okay, one last thing before we dive into a slightly more complicated example. Remember the eigenvalues? We got those by projecting the data onto the principal components and measuring the distances to the origin and then squaring and adding them together. We can convert them into variation around the origin we remember the origin is zero point zero or zero comma zero by adding, well, excuse me, by dividing by the sample size minus one. Uh, so I, 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 I'm just a guest lecturer. I don't know if you guys have talked about how to calculate variation. Um, if not, here's how you do it. The variation for PC1 is just the sum of the square distances divided by N minus one. And where N is the, is the number of samples uh, or observations in our data set. And so in this case, we see uh, uh, six observations that we measured um, for gene one and gene two. And so we have n equals six, and so we'd be dividing by five. For the sake of the example, imagine that the variation for PC1 is 15 and the variation for PC2 PC is three. So we can just look at the graph and we can see that there's more variation along the PC1 because the, the dots are further apart than they are along the, the PC2 axis or the Y axis. This means that the total variation around both PCs, so in both dimensions, is 15 plus three equals 18. And that means PC1 accounts for 15 divided by 18, which equals 0 0.83, which equals 83% of the total variation around the principal components. And PC2 accounts for 3 divided by 18, which equals 0 0.17, which equals 17% of the total variation around the PCs. Terminology alert. We got a lot of terminology we're going through today. So a scree plot is a graphical representation of the percentages of variation that each principal component accounts for. If any of you guys are out there are mountain climbers or rock climbers or something like that, scree. So if you have like a, a mount, like a, like a rocky mountain, 
uh, sometimes there'll be rock slides and and they just kind of fall down the mountain and that's that that slide that all those rocks that fell off the mountain that's called scree so that's like a mountaineering terminology scree and they and it and it typically you know starts off low and it gets up it gets high as it gets wedged up against the mountain and so these scree plots are supposed to i guess they reminded someone of what these piles of rocks look like um so there's another aside anyways we're going to talk more about scree plots later bam Okay, now let's quickly go through a slightly more complicated example. This time uh, we've got uh, PCA with three variables. In this case, that means three genes. And it, it's PCA is pretty much the same, PCA with three variables is pretty much the same as uh, PCA with two variables. You center the data. Oh, by the way, now that we're using three genes, now we're kind of faking that third dimension. So gene three is depth and it's going out the back of your computer screen through the window or the wall or whatever is behind your computer screen. It's going that way. Um, so that's, uh, that's depth. Anyways, we just like before we center the data and then we find the best fitting line that goes through the origin. We still have to go through that origin, but now we've got a little bit more wiggle room instead of just going like this and rotating like a clock we can now kind of rotate in three-dimensional space, just like my crazy elbows doing it. Um, so just like before, the best fitting line is PC1. And remember, we define best fitting as it um, maximizes uh, the square distances between once we project the data onto that line and the origin. So when we maximize those, dist this, those squared distances, uh, we've got a We've got a best fitting line. That's our criteria for defining best. Uh, but now the recipe for PC1 has three ingredients. So we've got uh, one thing for gene one, one, one thing for gene two, or you know, and then an ingredient for gene three. So 0 0.62 parts gene one, 0 0.15 parts gene two, and 0 0.77 parts gene three. And so what that tells us is that PC1 is or the data is mostly spread out along this depth axis, this gene three axis. And I'm trying to draw that with these like slightly harder to see smaller balls, you know, and that's like supposed to be far away. And these larger, brighter balls are supposed to be closer to us. Um, and I'm trying to draw that. You just have to imagine it that we have this three dimensional thing going on. So yeah, so in this case, gene three is the most important ingredient for PC1. Then you find PC2, the next best fitting line given that it goes through the origin and is perpendicular to PC1. And a lot of people have trouble with this. You, you have to imagine that the line right now is, is going like this, like my arm. I don't know if you can see my arm. And, and PC2 is gonna rotate around like this. A lot of people on, online, when they look at my video, they're like, that is not perpendicular. Uh, but it is just because we've got some weird three-dimensional thing. And you can imagine my, my right arm over here being perpendicular and rotating around my left arm. Uh, so that gives us PC2 and the recipe for PC2. In this case, gene one is the most important ingredient for PC2. So the data in this case are now spread along uh, gene one. Lastly, we find PC3, the best fitting line that goes to the origin and is perpendicular to both PC2, PC1 and PC2. And I can't do that with my arms. Uh, so you just have to take my word for it that in three dimensions, uh, we've got one more access, I guess going like this. Um, uh, it's kind of a mess, uh, but you can kind of get the idea that uh, in three dimensions, it's possible to have three different lines that are perpendicular to us, just like the original axes are, but just rotated in a new orientation. Okay, and if we had more genes, we just keep finding more and more principal components by adding perpendicular lines and rotating them. In theory, <clears throat> there is one principal component per gene or variable, but in practice, the number of principal components is either the number of variables or the number of samples, whichever is smaller. 
And if this is confusing, don't sweat it. We're going to talk about this in about, we're going to, once we get to the end of this section, we're going to take a, like a, I don't know, a five second break while I stop the recording and then start it up again. And then we'll talk about this in detail. So uh, I know this is going fast now. We'll talk about it more later. Okay. Once you have all the principal components figured out, you can use the eigenvalues. Remember, those are the sum of the squares or of the distances to determine the proportion of variation that each principal component accounts for. In this case, PC1 accounts for 79% of the variation. PC2 accounts for 15%. And PC3 accounts only for only 6% of the variation. And here's the scree plot. Remember, this is our, these are our rocks on the edge of the mountain. PC1 and PC2 account for the vast majority of the variation in the, in the data. And that means that a 2D graph using just PC1 and PC2 would be a good approximation of this 3D graph since it would account for 94% of the original variation in the data. So we're using the scree plot as a way to justify throwing away PC3 and just reducing it to a two-dimensional graph. So to, to convert that 3D graph into 2D PCA graph, we strip away everything but the data in PC1 and PC2. And then we project the samples onto PC1. And then we project them onto PC2. And then we rotate so that PC1 is horizontal and PC2 is vertical. And this just makes everything easier to look at. And since these projected points correspond to sample four, this is where sample four goes in our new PCA plot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Double bam. To review, we started with an awkward three-dimensional graph that was kind of hard to read. And I had to do a lot of arm waving and yeah, I had to do arm waving, not just hand waving. And then we calculated the principal components. And then with the eigenvalues for PC1 and PC2, we determined that a two-dimensional graph would still be very in informative because, it, because the first two principal components, uh, they account for 94 or 96, I can't remember exactly what it was, over 90% of the original variation. So there's just a little bit of sort of background noise that, P, that PC3 accounts for. And lastly, uh, because of the scree plot, we can throw away PC3 and we can use PC1 and PC2 to draw a two-dimensional graph of the data. If we measured four genes per mouse, we would not be able to draw a four-dimensional graph of the data. Wah, wah. But that doesn't stop us from doing the PCA math, which doesn't care if we can draw it or not, and looking at a scree plot. In this case, PC1 and PC2 account for 90% of the variation. So we can just use those to draw a two-dimensional PCA graph. So we project the samples onto the first two PCs. And these two projected points correspond to sample two. So sample two goes here. And then we just say, bam, because it's awesome. Note, if the scree plot looked like this, where PC3 and principal component four account for a substantial amount of the variation, then just using the first two PCs would not create a very accurate representation of the data. Wah, wah. However, even a noisy PCA plot like this uh, can be used to identify clusters of data. These samples are still more similar to each other than they are to the other samples. Little bam. All right, now it's time for a brief pause and I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit so I can stop recording. <laughs>